Uh, so I just wanted to welcome you to today's session um, around how to engage with the media. Um, we've got, uh, uh, I'm Helen from Lloyds Bank Foundation. I'm the Events and Communication Officer and I've been working alongside Philippa Budgen, who'll be hosting the session today um, around this session. Uh, so Philippa comes with a whole uh, range of experience as both a journalist and reporter. Uh, she's been a BBC reporter for over 15 years, working on uh, Radio 4 Women's Hour, You and Yours, and also on the World Service on Radio 5 Live. Uh, she's been working in the charity sector for a number of years now, providing media training and media strategy advice. And she's also got a particular interest in the criminal, justice, criminal and social justice sectors. Um, and has an MA in criminal law and criminal justice and I think there's some of you on the call today from work that she's done before which is really great to see, see you here as well. Um, I'd also like to welcome uh, Renette Roberts who is the director of Oasis, a small and local charity in Cardiff that supports asylum seekers and refugees. Renette's built up a wealth of experience of working with the media and she's kindly joined us today to share some of those experiences and tell us a little bit about the media coverage that she's secured along with her team over the past few months in relation to coronavirus. So before I hand over to Philippa, I'm just going to go through some Zoom housekeeping points. Um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, it's always good to set some expectations for how things will work on Zoom. Um, so we've got uh, about 25 of us on the call today. Um, so it'd be great if you could just mute, keep your microphones muted when we're in this group because um, that will really help to avoid background noise. Um, if you could turn your video on, that would be great so that we can uh, really have a participatory session. Um, however, please feel free to keep that off if that's uh, better for you. Uh, we do appreciate that many of you might be in really busy environments today with children, partners, flatmates around. So if you do need to step away, uh, just switch off your uh, video and, and microphone and, and, and do what you need to do. Um, if you could all change your name, which I think most of you have already done, just so we know who's with us today, um, that would be great. And then just for those of you who might be newer to Zoom, um, you've got two ways that you can view this session. So you've got gallery view, which is the tiles of lots of people, <clears throat> and then you can switch it to speaker view. So when Philippa's uh, doing some of her presentation part of the session, it might be easier to switch to speaker view. Um, you'll see that we've got a chat box, um, which is along the bottom ribbon. Uh, please do engage today through that chat box. Um, it'll be really great to kind of fill up or asking for your uh, thoughts and reflections throughout the session. So um, it'd be great to get your, your thoughts in there. Um, and we'll obviously we're a fairly big group today to get everyone's feedback. So we'll do our best to address everyone's contributions. Um, and you can also uh, type to everybody or a specific person. So if you have a technical issue or something you want to flag with Philippa or I, you can message directly to us in there as well. Um, uh, final bit is that we are recording today's session and that's so that we can share it. We, this session was hugely popular and we, we were oversubscribed, so we're gonna be sharing this on our YouTube channel. Uh, the chat won't show in that recording and neither will the breakout rooms that you're in. So those are totally your space for today's session. Uh, if you do speak as part of this main space, uh, you might appear in the recording. So just wanted to let you all know that. Okay, so that's enough of the Zoom logistics for me. Um, I'll hand over to, to Philippa to kick us off and I hope you really enjoy the session. She's got a really, a really great agenda planned for you. So uh, yeah, over to you, Philippa. Thanks, Helen. Great to see you all today. Hello. Um, it's really, really encouraging to see so many of you here. Uh, I know 10.30 in the morning, a weekday is a really busy time. Um, so seeing you all come up on the gallery is really, um, encouraging in itself. Um, so many parts of the sector represented. Um, we've got domestic abuse charities, mental health charities, refugee, homelessness charities, and so many more. Um, and in terms of parts of England and Wales, um, also well represented, Winchester, Annick, Nottingham, Cardiff. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you get a lot out of today. Um, just as a bit of fun and by way of um, having some getting to know each other um, you were having a virtual coffee um, before you uh, joined us for the main group and you all had to think about what in lockdown kept you going the single object that kept you going so I for instance have been kept going by my running shoes and those of you who know me on this will know that um, that keeps me going a lot of the time but even more in lockdown 
Um, so would you just a few ideas of what's kept you going through lockdown would be lovely if you put in the chat and we can we can see what uh, what things have kept you going. You might also think of, I don't know, whether it's yeast, I gather sourdoughs taken off, a camera, um, binoculars, bird watching I hear is, is really popular. You, you tell us. So Nicola's into cycling, Julie's into her garden, Jess, her partner's dog, jogging and workout, Frangelina. Oh, we've got cats, dogs, horses, loads of animals and gardening. So yeah, we're all getting out and about in our own ways. Um, so today we're looking at how best to engage the media during the pandemic. Um, the first point which we have to ask is why? Well, lots of reasons. This might be about the need to communicate the impact of coronavirus on the people that you work with, on your communities. Um, it might be to raise money, more money, um, recruit volunteers, create policy change, change public perception. We're all shifting a bit in our attitudes. Is this the time to get in and say something that we need to hear about the people you work with who, are, who may often be demonized? Or it could be as simple as to satisfy your donors or trustees. So myriad reasons, but I think the really good point about the, the pandemic is that actually the media presents more of an opportunity than ever to advocate for positive change. So to have your voice and the voices of the people that you represent heard. Um, and quite simply, it shows that a small charities, your must haves, not nice to haves a really, really important way of getting that across. Um, so I'm just looking again at your chat, walking in fields around my village, gardening, yoga, uh, Darren says, yoga dog and bass guitar. <laughs> um, so the aim of this morning is to provide you with some top practical tips with engage on engaging with the media in what is a very fast moving media cycle. So I've seen these things from both sides, both as a journalist, um, so getting the story, doing the interview, and as a media consultant, supporting charities and organizations that want to get their message across and advocate for change. So to, to make this as practical as possible in what is a very, very busy time, uh, an hour and a half, this will, we will be whizzing through. Um, the session falls into three parts. So we'll look at how to make the most of the media and practical tips for working effectively with journalists. We'll hear from somebody who's already doing it successfully, Raynette from Oasis Charity in um, Cardiff. Uh, and you'll also really importantly have a chance to ask questions both of Raynette and me, um, because I think you, you'll find that as useful uh, as, as pretty much anything else. And all important, apply what you've been thinking about and hearing today to your own charities and the people that you work with. So how you're going to use the media to make the case for positive change. Um, we'll have a break, all important break. I know how tiring Zoom can be um, halfway through. So you can check emails, have a cuppa, um, yeah, essential. And in terms of the, the sort of how we'd like to do things today, um, we've been through the technicalities, but also in terms of tone, um, as I say, it is really busy. You're a group of over 30. So really important to make as much of this time as possible. Be present, embrace this time. It's about you, it's about your organization. Switch off your phone, mine switched off, just checked. Um, your social media notifications, your email notifications, just be in the zone as much as you can. Um, be respectful. It's obvious from the roll call that you filled in um, when you joined that very different levels of experience, but everyone can learn from each other um, and be inclusive. So be wary of jargon. We all have our own jargon. I'm aware that I use jargon sometimes. If you do, explain it readily, but try and, try and steer clear um, so that everyone outside of your expertise can understand. Um, and 
remember you've got chat if you're having any technical difficulties. Um, Helen is, is the technical whiz. So um, uh, yeah, she's, she's the person to flag up to if you're having any issues. Um, so in a moment, we're going to move you into groups so that you can have a look at a particular piece from the media. Um, and I'd like you just to have a quick look at, sorry, clunk, clunk, this. So this is Hassan. Welcome to Hassan. Hassan Akkad is involved very much with two charities called Choose Love and Refugees at Home. He's a Syrian refugee, and um, when a new, the new immigration bill became uh, more detailed and he heard what was in that, he made this vlog. I hope you can all hear. Hi, Boris. Hello, Mr. Prime Minister. My name is Hassan Ad, and I am proudly working as a cleaner in a hospital 10 miles away from the hospital which you were in. I joined around the same time, actually because I wanted to help this nation overcome this pandemic. Um, I've been really enjoying the clapping that you and your fellow ministers and the government do every week. Today, however, I felt uh, betrayed, stabbed in the back. I felt shocked to find out that you've decided, your government decided to exclude myself and my colleagues who work as cleaners and porters and uh, social care workers who are uh, we are all on minimum wage you've decided to exclude us from the bereavement scheme so if i die fighting coronavirus my partner isn't allowed for it isn't allowed an indefinite leave to remain this is your way of saying thank you to us now uh, i'm sending you this message hoping that you will reconsider because I did see a humble Boris after you were discharged from hospital. I saw a different Boris. So us migrants are on the front line doing these very demanding jobs to help this nation overcome this pandemic. And the least you can do if we die to give our families indefinite leave to remain. Please reconsider. And I hope to hear back from you. Thank you. So that was Hassan Akkad's personal appeal to the Prime Minister. It's very moving, isn't it? Um, what effect did it have? Well, immediately he became viral on Twitter. So he posted that vlog on Twitter. He's had 5 million views for that particular posting. Um, within hours, he was headline news on Good Morning Britain, on ITV, LBC, The Daily Mail, The Guardian. He went worldwide. So by the next day, the government had U-turned. He had done the ch two charities that he worked with, Choose Love and Refugees at Home, an enormous favour, I was going to say, but he benefited them enormously by that plea and it was it were it, it had an impact globally so what i'd like you to think about and and i'm hoping that all of you have had a chance to look at your own news piece that has made an impact on you um, that involved a charity in covid um, i would like you in your breakout groups to have a think about why that vlog worked so well in the media so things to think about are, you know, think about the timing, think about his style, think about the person who communicated that. Um, who else might have done that, but he chose to do it instead. So just have a think about why that played out so successfully in the media. And if you um, put some of your thoughts in the uh, chat, then we'll be able to see that and draw on your comments when we feed back. 
probably we'll only be able to come to um, three people in terms of live feedback as, as speakers because it's such you're such a big group and it's it's a it's a busy time but um, the more of you who can feed in the better thank you so we'll see you uh, in 10 minutes time you've got 10 minutes in the breakout keep the keep the comments going in chat I'd like you also sorry I should have said to nominate one person per group who's going to note take and will offer to feed back and you can show your willingness to feed back either by literally just going like this and putting your paper up or by putting it in the chat room so that we can know look forward to hearing what you decide what, what your about your discussions all right i'm gonna pop you all into breakouts now so uh, you'll see a little notification I think that's everyone for that's everyone is it brilliant um i hope you had some really interesting discussions uh and i would really be grateful if a few of you would put up your piece of paper who've been nominated to give us some feedback on what it was that really struck you about this vlog in particular so Excellent. Sarah, I can see you. Uh, so I'll go to, I'll, I'll just read out in order. Sarah, Nadine and Sue, please. Um, so we agreed it was, it was really powerful and we think that that came from the honesty that it was displaying. So it's incredibly authentic. He was just in his car, he was in his scrub. So either just before or just after work. And it was a very, very visceral reaction to a, to an immediate situation that he was experiencing. Um, we thought that it struck a chord because it wasn't just talking, a, it wasn't a, a rage against all of the stuff that was going wrong. It was very specific and targeted about a particular thing. So that message was able to come across really clearly and that he'd crafted that message really well in a rational manner so that it was, you know, linking into Boris's experience, but also, whilst it felt like a direct conversation to him it was also mentioning the clapping so there was a hint of everyone else watching this you're all culpable too this isn't just him you're all yeah. doing that. so kind of encouraging that self-examination of our own behaviors um and it, it was interesting that he wasn't dwelling on the sort of his migration backstory so he wasn't talking about what brought him here or enabling the water to become muddy about people's opinion on um immigration it was very much this is this is the issue that we're we're talking about now um and just the um the timing of it using twitter as a platform um just very precise i think great thank you yeah um very very um apposite comments sue what what did you what did your group what struck your group Are you still on mute? Oh, so not Sue. I'm so sorry. Nadine, I'm so sorry. I was sorry. That's okay. Um, so we had a lot of similar comments, but we were talking about, you know, he was in uniform. It was very honest. Um, what else did we say? And just looking at other angles on it as well, of would it have worked if it was a CEO of one of those charities that he was affiliated with? You know, if that was a script, and it was presented as, as something and also comparing it to would it have been successful if it had been aggrieved by something and then put it out as a petition would that have had the same effect probably not now um, but all things of mentioning about minimum wage and refugee they're huge big areas of vulnerability as well great thank you and sue what did you what did your group land on but possibly different did you pick up on anything a bit different from those I, other two groups that i think that he came across as very genuine and um he was it was a very personal emotional and passionate way of coming across with something and obviously he didn't plan it all it was almost like he'd got very worked up at the news sat in his car and then he very calmly in as calm way as he could got this message across and the fact that he spoke to Boris personally as mm. someone in that situation and sort of challenged Boris about how he'd sort of I can't remember how we put it that Boris was like quite humbled by his experience of Covid 
and he'd seen that and he was sort of challenging him on that which we thought was quite powerful um because he's sort of he's speaking personally from his situation but he's then speaking personally to boris um and challenging him as well what was i was very excited i said to the group that this was actually the story that i had chosen to bring with uh. me <laughs> so <laughs> i was quite excited when i saw he came on the screen <laughs> i think that's i think everything else other people have said as well but yeah fantastic did anyone else put if you put up put up a piece of paper if you'd actually chosen this as well as the thing as the piece in the news that you felt illustrated a charity doing media well anyone else like sue no um i'd be really interested though to hear what the other stories were that you did pick up on so perhaps you could put in chat just the the headline to the stories that you did pick up on because um it's really good to know that actually there are lots out there and it's good for you to think your way around the stories that you're seeing on a on a regular basis so i would have said something similar i mean I, what i'm hearing from you is that you're saying it was authentic and emotional um the, the the he gauged it right to make it so personal but he struck the right tone he what he 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 trod the line between being um, I suppose accusatory, but also actually appealing to the better nature. I mean, he was very clever at that. He read it well. The timing was right. Uh, the setting in his car, uh, not dissimilar to the nurse who made that plea about people not ransacking the supermarkets at the beginning of lockdown. So um, the vlog most definitely has its place in terms of attracting the attention of the media and a well-placed vlog is something is definitely something to think about so we would like to look at um what what um what helps you to cut through a packed news agenda so first things first let's be really really clear it is about a sim a story plain and simple so Journalists, absolute stock in trade is a sto a stories. So Hassan in himself is a story. Um, you, you referred in our, uh, just a moment ago to his backstory. His backstory, having seen the horrors of Syria, is the start of his story. Then him becoming a, nurse, a, a cleaner in the hospitals, another part of his story. He's just overturned the Prime Minister. He's, he's won a point against the Prime Minister. He is most definitely a story in journalistic terms in himself. So what do we mean by a story? And, and I keep coming back to it and saying this is in journalistic terms because I, this is, I think, you know, unlocking that key is essential for understanding how best to engage with the media, particularly at a very busy time. So definition of a story in journalistic ter terms um, and one that every journalism student learns and really never forgets is there are two ways of defining a story one is it's an ordinary event happening to an extraordinary person so when prince charles tested positive at a time when loads of people were testing positive for covid that became headline news and you know managed to knock off much more important stories because he was he is extraordinary um young carers looking after ill family members at home interestingly the media go with the narrative and are prepared to accept that if you're a young carer you are exceptional you're extraordinary so what's the flip side of that the uh, picking up on the extraordinary an extraordinary event happening to an ordinary person so the COVID patient who was in hospital for nearly two months in Scotland was on the news at 10 only the other day because that is an extraordinary experience for him happening to an ordinary person. So you need to be really clear as, a, as an organisation what your story is and where your story fits into the news. And this is where the COVID element comes in. So at the beginning of COVID, Unless you were a health charity, it was really, really hard to get anything in the media because the media were 
obsessed with death figures and the science behind COVID and our response to it. And really there was no bandwidth for anything else. So if you were a justice charity or you were a, um, homelessness actually was a bit different, but if you, you know, other charities just didn't really get a look in. That's changed now. We're looking at the impact of COVID long-term. We're looking at the response to how we recover. So your charities have much more bandwidth. Um, and if you're going to enter this landscape, you need to have a message. Why do you need a message? Because it keeps you in control. And it's very easy, again, a bit like a story to say, oh, you need to get your message straight. What do we, what, what are the elements of a message? So I like to um, bracket three elements of a message together. So I'm going to use the Macmillan cancer story that was recently in the news um, to give you an example of this. So they were highlighting the fact that lot, too many people weren't getting either diagnosed or treated for cancer um, in the disruption of COVID. So they first element to a message, they describe the problem so we understand it's essential that your audience understands what the problem is. So in Macmillan cancer terms, too many people are not having life-saving treatment in COVID. Very simple. Then they tell us how to respond. So you want your audience, to, it's an unsubtle medium. You want your audience to know, should they be shocked? Should they be outraged? Should they be um, surprised? What should they be? So we should be really disturbed that too many people are not having life-saving cancer treatment in, in COVID. Well, too many people will die unnecessarily. This is really disturbing. Just very simple. What do we need to do? What's the action, the call for action? So we've done understand, respond, action is the final element. We need we need, in Macmillan cancer terms, we need to restore the NH service, NHS services urgently so people can live healthy lives. Really simple message. So understand, respond, and action. Those are your three key elements to any message. And that will keep you going through both easy and tough interviews. Now, what I'm not gonna say is be like a politician and sound like you're, you've been, you know, you're, you're t totally cynical and you've had so much media training, you can't answer a question straight. Um, it's, you will not have overprepared if you have a message. You will not sound like a politician. They do it day in, day out. That's their job. Your job is to be authentic and natural like Hassan. So another key element, number three tip, timing is golden. Timing is absolutely everything. You pick your time even when you call a journalist. So if, your journal if the journalist you're ringing is a print journalist, chances are they're really busy when they first get in at about half past eight, nine o'clock. Then they've, they've, they've had their meetings and they're working on their stories. Then they might be filing for a new, uh, lunchtime um, online edition. And then they're going to be really busy again around five, six o'clock. So pick your time to ring your journalist. Get to know their routine. Pick your time in terms of the news hook. So... It's refugee week at the moment. It, it was volunteer week a few, a few weeks ago. Um, it's small charities week. It's, national, it's loneliness awareness week. These are all hooks. They're, they're reasons to be engaged with the subject. I would say it's a note of caution with weeks. Do test, um, test it on your friends first because these weeks are like two a penny. And... Um, I'm personally a little bit cautious of overusing them, but they do have their place. Um, policy. When policy is going through Parliament, that's your time to um, send an open letter to the, the Health Committee or the Homelessness Committee, um, and you can get that covered in the media. So, journalists have hundreds of emails every day dozens of press releases um, all sorts of schools of thought on whether a press release is actually worth it which i won't go into now but the point is they are bombarded by all sorts of um, mechanisms to attract their attention the best way is either through knowing them or through social media 
and you can get to know journalists pretty quickly through so social media and in particular Twitter. So what you'll, you'll see that journalists use it themselves. They will, you know, if they like what you're talking about, they may well um, send, a, send a tweet to you and say, please, will you follow me so I can direct message you? It's a very well-established trick. Um, but don't forget the old. So I've just put up a, a, a letter with a particular prison charity that I work with, um, Spark Inside. This came about as a result of an article in the um, Telegraph, which we felt needed a different perspective. And it took half an hour to coordinate. We knew what our message was. We'd already worked it out from before. And we just cracked out this letter and it was in, in the paper the next day. So, and the reason that was really effective was it then gave rise to several interviews on the back of it, broadcast interviews. So don't forget the old. That is a really effective way to get journalists to see you. They have newspapers in their newsrooms. And, mo and finally, don't be afraid to call. You need to have a pitch, a punchy pitch of the story you're selling to the journalist in three sentences. It really is as crass as that because they, they are so time constrained that, and they have very limited attention span. You need to be able to sell a few buzzwords to them. You know, this is a fascinating story. We are a remarkable charity. Um, no one's ever seen it like this before. Um, it's an overlooked community we work with. They all want to feel that they're getting a sense of um, something other people don't know. So just to recap really, really quickly, I know I've been whizzing through this because um, it's almost break time. Um, think about your story. It's absolute top tip. Have your message prepared. Remember, time is golden. The time that you contact the journalist, the time that you're pitching. Um, use old and new means of um, media and pick up the phone. Make sure that you've pulled with your colleagues contacts for co journalists that you can go to. And um, that, in a nutshell, is some very, very basic top tips for attracting the attention of journalists at a very busy time. So we're going to say to you, um, Go and have your cup of tea and have a nice break. Um, come back in five minutes. Um, and when you're on your break, I'd really like you to have a think about what you've talked about in your groups, what I've just said in terms of top tips. And um, think of what the, your takeaway is. What one thing have you learned that has been really helpful? Um, and if you could put that in your chat, in the chat when you come back, that would be great. So see you in five minutes. It's uh, 17 minutes past uh, 11 now. So, well, just after, just after 20, 20 past, please. Sorry, that isn't really five minutes, is it? <laughs> okay, see you in a minute. Bye. Hi, welcome back, everybody. I've got some really lovely comments coming through around uh, picking out uh, how to find out what's important for the journalists and not for you. Uh, the extraordinary event and for an extraordinary, extraordinary event for an ordinary person and vice versa. Um, but I'll hand back to, to Philippa now to carry, carry on the session. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to draw attention to one of the stories that came up in the, um, in the chat that you've obviously looked at over the weekend. So there's a lovely one from Chantal um, that says, I chose a local story in Lancashire. A young lad cycled from Lancashire to London on a stationary bike at home to raise money for the homelessness charity I work for for his 21st birthday. His goal was 150 pounds. He reached 680 pounds. So that's a really nice story. A re and I imagine that got into the local press. I'm hoping so. Um, Chantel, did it get thumbs up if it got yeah. into the yeah, local it press? Did. Yeah, it was a really, really great response because uh, he was a young lad himself. So he had that audience online, that social media presence, which made it so, um, you know, it got the message got out there and it gave us a lot of um, understanding what we do as a local charity, even though we're in lockdown, we were still able to raise money and raise awareness. 
because Brilliant. of what this young person did for us and we were so grateful yeah excellent um yeah and your takeaway tips anyone who wants to carry on writing in what you've got so far um darren says it's good to have breakdown of the essential components of a story um help to clarify your thinking on engaging with the media um the breaking down of a message has obviously been really useful for people to understand respond and to act um yeah and the ordinary ordinary extraordinary element to a story um so you've you've obviously taken on board your, your um the the sort of the some of those absolute top tips um but i think what is really helpful is to hear from someone who's also trod this path um, and has engaged with the media over several years also specifically in covid with three stories um, that have gone to the media so um, bbc wales i know of channel four and um, one other that i'm sure renette will mention when we're speaking so we're really lucky that renette roberts um, who is the ceo of oasis refugee center in cardiff is going to tell us about some insights that she's gleaned over the years and specifically in covid of dealing with um, both local and national media so Raynette, um we spoke last week and I was very aware we could have gone on for a long time because you've, you've got all sorts of really helpful insights. Um, sorry, I was going to show you very quickly um, a particular story. Let me show you right. Oh, sorry. That this is sorry. This is a story that hit um, BBC Wales earlier on in the lockdown. Um, Raynette's on the left and one of the refugees that Raynette works with and her colleagues work with, Hasham, is on the right. Um, and without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Raynette to tell us how, how did that BBC Wales story that we've just seen on the screen come about, Raynette? Um, I was approached by BBC and they came in and they socially distanced Bill. And Interestingly, even though we talked about it, I, I said to them both um, earlier last week that for me, it was one of the worst interviews we've ever done in the 11 years that we've been going and I felt very frustrated by it, but it had a very big impact. It, we got more donations and more response from that than we've ever had from anything. And I was pleasantly surprised. I was really cross with myself and cross that they they had edited bits out, the positive story. I hate saying negative stuff. And they they picked up on something that ruffled a few feathers. But the general public, we had people from around the corner. Um, we're in quite a deprived area of Cardiff um, for Splot, <laughs> or Splo, depending how you call it. Um, and people were coming, neighbours were coming and giving just cash and bringing food. It was amazing because we, we've been giving out food parcels um, and give it, still giving out meals to um, our refugees and asylum seekers that come here. So that was the, the main bit of the story. So how did people give? Um, some people gave through PayPal, um, donations online, through CAF, through just uh, letters, po um, things in the post, through the, um, oh, there's a chat, uh, a charity donation site that I can't think of, it's gone out of my head. But just and just coming to the door with, with some money in their hands and things. Um, and not some anonymous, some not anonymous, some gift aiding, some not gift aiding. So it had a big impact and it it meant that other people were asking what they could do to help as well. So it was good. So whilst it didn't feel a comfortable interview, it still delivered great results for you yes yeah it did yes um and it just reminded me of being more concise when i talk to the press right and in terms of of that particular one the bbc wales one i was saying um that my experience in the beginning of lockdown was that actually it was really hard to get any non-health related stories um to cut through in the the media but you 
you did. I mean, you did in April. That was April. That was mid-April. So at a time when the health aspect was at its absolute worst. Um, why do you think you managed to do that? Um, I think there was there were multiple things. The, the gentleman that came and interviewed us, he'd already been in before. He'd done a radio interview, so he knew about Oasis. We were prepared, so we were already up and running and delivering the services. And I think also we had tweeted about what we were doing and we put it on Facebook and other social media and our website that we were still operating. So it's quite a small community in Cardiff. So people knew about it, even though we didn't push for interviews. Um, I don't think we rarely, we rarely do that. So that's what, so in terms of the mechanics, because I think people will be interested in the actual mechanics. Did that journalist approach you or did you approach the journalist? The journalist approached us. Right. And is that the typical trend of how things happen for you? Yes, it is. Yes. Right. Um, some of them have been students or have volunteered with us. So when they've gone further along, um, they've remembered us and come back. So we've got a few that have come back. Right. But I would try to be polite to the students, even though they drive me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, one of the things I noticed, I was looking on your Twitter feed, and you've got a really engaging Twitter feed. You're co you know, there's, there's, there's constant content on there. So whether it's Eid or whether it's Easter or whether it's, yeah. You, it's a really lively Twitter feed. I, I wonder how much you think that feeds into the interest of the wider media. I think it does a great deal because we get retweeted and people started following us and I think we try and have a positive story. Um, I firmly believe that I don't want to whinge all the time. So having a positive story for us and, and also being humorous as well and being human, mm. I think is really important. One of the things that I'm very aware of is that there is an element of journalism that's that's becoming much better established um and i don't know whether other people forgive me if i'm telling you something you already know but some of you i i, I suspect don't there is a strain of journalism that is called solutions focused journalism positive journalism it doesn't matter you know every organization has a slightly different way of of describing it but broadly speaking they're 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 really trying hard to get positive stories out there because they're aware that actually we've got limited appetite for, for constant doom and gloom and it sounds like you actually fit into that you you, you fit that um criteria quite quite neatly just because of how you approach things yeah i i would agree i think there's been an increased interest in fact um the bbc are in the in filming outside at the moment are they fantastic for refugee week um, yes, we've got someone that's learned Welsh. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> I came out of my brain there. Well, you can go and talk to the BBC, they're downstairs. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. You are really walking the walk, aren't you? Well, no, it's okay. because we, we're happy to let them come in and we can. We can. Yeah. Today, so so in, in terms of people with lived experience, um, case studies, as journalists like to call it, call, call people with lived experience, um, What's been your experience of, of, of putting people up for the media who, who do have experience of your centre? Um, I think you have to make them aware of what it involves. Um, sometimes reassure them. Sometimes people want to talk about just their experience here and they don't want to relive their trauma from back home. Um, I've, we've got a member of staff who's a Syrian doctor and he's been in the press a lot and he's been really upset by the written comments underneath the piece. So I've told him not to read them. Mm -hmm. So you've got to make people aware that there they're unpleasant people out there that will write utter rubbish and it's just not good for your brain. And for some of them also, if they are interviewed, You've got to support them afterwards because they're re for, for every organisation, they're really reliving their trauma. And if they get bombarded a lot and people still want to speak to that one person all the time, I remember one of them saying, a Syrian was saying, well, what do I get out of it? You know, what, I'm reliving my experience, but how does that help me? So it's, it's trying to sh share the burden, I think, as well. 
And what do you see people getting out of it? I mean, I presume you're, you're fairly careful about how you filter and you're, you, know you're, you know the people you work with, but what, what, for those who benefit, what do they get from it? A lot of them get gaining confidence with their English. They feel proud that they've spoken up about um, their experiences and, and share something with the, the public. Um, they feel that because we're quite um, community orientated here, they feel they've given something back to us, so they're supporting us and they can tell other people how they feel about us as an organisation. So I think it can have a very positive effect and some that have feel they haven't got good enough English have then been able to show that yes, they can, they can share their stories and they've had positive feedback as well from people that they work with too. Brilliant. So very, very quickly, because I know that people are going to be really keen to hear their answers, their questions answered. And um, we've got some coming in already through chat. And if you if you do have anything you want to ask either Renette or me um, from the other side of the perspective, um, what one top tip would you give for people who are new to this and want to engage with the media at a really busy time like COVID and pressured time? Wow, ah, 10, now I've got to do one. <laughs> Just one. Be yourself. Okay, brilliant. Be yourself. So, Helen, do you want to read out some of the, the questions that we've had come out already? Yep, just got, got one at the moment. So as we're going, uh, answering this one, please feel free to add some more. But I've got a question uh, for Annette around uh, why you felt that that interview was uh, turned negative and lost your positive message. And kind of, I guess, your, your reflections on that a bit more. Um, Julie, you asked that question, so I hope I, I portrayed that right. Um, I think for me, there was, I was disappointed they didn't use a really positive story that I told them about someone that had moved to London and how they were supporting us with, from their distribution centre. They didn't pick up on that, they just said we were going to London to get food. So they missed out the positive bit of that, they went for the sensational bit, so I, that was my frustration really more than anything okay and um anyone anyone who would like to ask a question direct to Raynette, maybe put up your a piece of paper and and quickly ask her what, what you'd like to ask i'm sure you must be burning with mm -hmm. questions so that as well uh, we've got a question around uh, a charity that works in birmingham uh, often portrayed very negatively um, how can they get the media interest in the positive stories of the good work that goes on in that area? I guess linked to that positive piece. Uh, sh what, shall I answer that first and then um, we'll see what you think, Renette. Um, so in terms of making your story sound more positive, I think what you have to do is tell the story. So include human stories because Journalists aren't deliberately excluding the positive, but they need to be able to show it. I mean, that's what any journalist will tell you. I mean, TV need pictures, um, print on the whole need pictures. And the more you can give to them that sort of makes it easy for them to, to, to show that positive light, the, the better you can do it. And I would say local is where that stuff's at. So, you know, like the, the, the guy on his static bicycle in Lancashire, you know, those are great local, local stories. So tap into your um, radio, local radio stations, local newspapers. What do you say, Renette? I would say, yeah, use, use your website, use social media, because people Google, journalists will Google, like we all do. And if you come up near the top, they will, they will contact you and always be positive, I think. And I try to be as accommodating as possible when, a journalist comes our way because you never know where it may go. Uh, so Renette, I'm seeing one here from Joe who says, my concern working with homeless, uh, homeless people is that every good news story gets turned around. So again, similar. Have you got anything specific you could add, particularly from, from working with refugees that might in some way feed into the, the issues with homelessness? Um, I would agree, I think. We had a phase when every journalist only wanted to speak to a Syrian um, and that's often still happens. So I try and push them away towards something else. Um, and I'm just careful on who I share, whose stories I share. I think 
something a little different as well. Maybe talking to someone that's helped a homeless person or set the workplace for the homeless person. So you twist the story a little. So it's not just focusing on that poor individual that may feel a bit bombarded. I mean, what I would say from, from my perspective is also the better you know the journalist, this is where being media savvy is really important. So if someone rings you up and says, you know, I'm Anthony from the Evening Standard or, you know, um, yeah, Coventry Evening Telegraph or whatever, you know, don't agree to anything until you've seen the stuff they write. Mm -hmm. So if someone's saying to you, and, and lots of journalists will, um, you know, oh, I'm going to just paint a really, it, it's, it's, it's just a nice little story, you know. A, worry about the nice little stories because actually you still need to have your message as tight as ever um in that sense and don't get lulled into a false sense of security but b look at whether this guy that's telling you he's doing a nice little story does nice little stories or whether you're likely to get yourself embroiled in something much bigger so you know you just have to consume the media yourself and i i, I mean i say this all the time and sometimes i actually forget to say it because it comes so second nature to me but you know one of the most the absolute groundwork for all of this is to know know the media that's relevant to you and before you pitch in just get a feel for what stories are knocking around and also understand the news generally because you know you can see with with, with covid and black lives matter you know things get turned around so quickly and suddenly something that wasn't hugely popular as a as a narrative can suddenly become the thing of the moment and and you know you you need to know how you'll pitch into that or whether it's right for you to pitch into it because you need to know where the mood music is. I would totally agree with you. Having, having done a right-wing radio show that was on a web radio, not investigating first and realising two minutes in that I really shouldn't have been on that show, um, I would yeah, check who's asking what their, what their story they're trying to put, um, portray as well. And feel free to say no. No. Yeah. If you don't want, feel comfortable, just say, no, I can't at the moment. It's not possible. Yeah. So we've had a question again from, from Joe saying, how, how do I find out who my local journalists are to build a relationship with? Renette, what, what do you do to tap into your local network? Um, thinking we've got a media person that helps us. Um, and I think tweeting or reaching out to people and someone told me that LinkedIn, I'm not on very good at LinkedIn, but that LinkedIn is also very good for reaching out to people. I think it's becoming more popular. So con email, email them or tweets or follow them on Twitter, the journalists, and then they might follow you back. Yep. Great. Okay. Well, we could go on for a long time, but um, sadly, we're running out of time to be able to do that. And there's a really important element to the, to the next bit that applies to you. So, um, I mean, what, what came across to me, Renée, is that you know, you're, you're reinforcing that you really need to know your story and your message, prepare well so that there are no surprises, know the platform you're on. Don't forget local media is really helpful, particularly if it's a, a positive story you need to get across and the people you work with are often demonized. The local papers are very often the best people to, to look for for that. Um, and you gave us some really useful tips and insights into working with people with lived experience, the, the strengths and the sensitivities. Um, so now we go back to you and ask you to do some really um, good hard thinking. You've heard um, these considerations and what, what we'd like you to do now for the next five minutes, really intense time of reflection. So you'll need a pen and paper. I, it depends how you like to make notes or do you do mind maps or you know, however you like to sort of brain dump. I'd like you to consider one key question. How will you get your charity's voice heard during the pandemic? So think about the story, think about the audience you need to reach, think about why it is you're even doing it, so what you want to achieve, um, who should you talk to, um, that will get you going with thinking about that. And second aspect to this, what one practical next step are you going to take 
in order to um, make that that media engagement work so just got five minutes it's so basically we'll bring you back just after 10 to 12 have fun okay um, bringing you back a little earlier than we said because I think it looks like you're all pretty much there um, so we've got a few minutes just to um, wrap up any questions you might have for me um, specific to your organization or specific to your way of dealing with the media. Um, and while you're doing that, I'd really like you to, um, each one of you, if you can, put in chat what your next step is in terms of the media. So when you did that brain dump and you thought, well, how am I actually gonna achieve this? What was the next step you put in? So Chantelle says, I'm going to reach out to the local people in my area, especially online via social media. Um, use a clear message with buzzwords and ways in which people can help. Excellent. Getting the messaging across there. Sarah says, create a three sentence pitch. We tend to over explain. Look at Lynn Tiller says, look at the media options in my area. So good, you're looking at local. Um, going to use Twitter more to promote our charity and follow local journalists. Excellent idea. Nicola says, be more positive about media approaches we get. That's following the Renette approach. Um, Mohammed, find out who the local reporters are and try and connect. Um, so all really positive steps. Um, Jess says, refine our key messages. Um, Jess, uh, ask from current evidence about impact of COVID on women we represent. Exactly, so that you cannot underestimate um, the wealth of insights that you get from the actual people you work with. Um, so that is all very, very helpful. If there's anything you now want to ask me, um, this is your opportunity. Just, I can take a couple of questions, either in chat or if you put up your hand as it were, by raising a paper, you're welcome to ask me a quick question. I'm aware we're cracking on with time. So, Lucy, Lucy really, Reynolds. Really quick one. Um, yeah. We haven't got anybody doing marketing for us. We're busy with delivery, so we're fitting the marketing around this. I suspect like a lot of small charities and we've got a fundraiser coming up. In your experience, is it better just to drop it right across the paper, social media, Facebook and Twitter, or to specifically target one group of people or one journalist? Because I worry when we're doing fundraising events that the story gets everywhere and in such getting everywhere, people kind of go, oh, there it is again. Is it better to be more specific with who you're targeting with it? So there's not really a really neat answer. It all depends on what it is you're trying to get across. But I would say um, being specific is always a good idea, at least in the early days, because you can build on that um, and build on the, the, the network that, and contacts that you make. Um, yeah, so I'd say, so probably if in doubt, be specific. You can always then become a bit more scattergun if you need to. But yeah, the more targeted you can be at the beginning, the better. Anyone else have anything they'd like to ask? You can raise your paper. Ah, oh, Sarah. Um, yeah, so I I used to work in comms at the BBC before my current job. And what we started to find is that we were basically having to write the pieces and that and create the, create all of the content ourselves rather than journalists. Um, creating their own story and I'm I'm just wondering any any tips on getting the right balance between that between sort of taking on all that work particularly we find that with maybe local um, print press um, well it's a challenge because particularly local papers are incredibly strapped for money and time so the more you can hand it to them on the plate the well the, the fairer representation you'll get and the more delighted you'll be when you see yourself in there but yeah it's very time consuming um i think that the key with that is to be to be very specific about the, the times you go to the media 
and I would always be tempted in handing it to them on a plate, to be honest, unless you know someone really well, in which case you have a track, re track record and you kind of can fall back on the comfort of previous stories and you say, oh, it's a bit like that story, you know, just takes this one on a little bit, in which case you can trust them, but mostly I'd hand it to them on a plate. Um, we really are coming to the end of, of my bit now. So um, I would just like to say um, thank you very much for, for being such a willing and um, participatory audience and um, giving your thoughts so freely and um, yeah, being open to what there is to do with the media because it really is a time to kickstart your media if you want to represent the, 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 the best interests of many of your groups. Obviously for some people that won't be right. Um, but what I've tried to do today is kickstart you to give you a whistle stop tour of the practical ways to engage the media on sensitive issues. Just a really quick repeat of my top tips. Think about your story, think about your message and prepare it well, understand, respond, act, those three key elements. Time is golden, make yourself visible, Twitter, vlogs, blogs, they're all great. Letters to editors too, old and new. And don't forget to pick up the phone. So it's a bit, of, I've bombarded you with loads of information, loads of ideas. Raynette has been incredibly helpful. Raynette, thank you for being such a, a willing, um, yeah, interviewee participant in this and sharing your wealth of knowledge and experience in terms of engaging with the media. Um, if, if anything I've said needs a bit of clarification or your, you know, swithering about where to go for the next step, you can contact me via Helen and I'm happy to pick up on a few sort of loose ends that inevitably we haven't been able to deal with today. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Philippa Budgeon. You can see the kind of stuff that I do. Um, it's a really busy time and it's time for me to say thank you, good luck and over to Helen. Hi there, so just before all of you go, I just wanted to um, echo uh, Philippa's thanks to Annette and also to Philippa herself for producing a really fantastic session. Um, I've definitely learned lots as part of this, so I hope you have as well. Um, just to remind you that we recorded the session today, we'll send a follow-up email, which will include uh, the link to the recording. Uh, if you could just be patient with us and give us a few days to do that, we'll just have to edit out um, the bit where you all went off to the breakouts and me and Philippa are just sat there, things like that. So bear with us as we do that and we'll get that sent out to you. Um, also, just before you leave, I just wanted to um, ask for a little bit of feedback on today's session. So we're gonna launch a poll, um, which you will see shortly, which just has four questions, which just helps us get a bit of a sense of how you found the session today. Um, if you've got any other uh, feedback that you wanna share, uh, you've all got my uh, email or we'll do when I send the follow-up. And if you want to speak to Philip on and they obviously get in touch and we can uh, link you up. Um, but that's everything for me. Thank you so much for your time. I know you're all really busy people at the moment along this side of charity, so. So thanks for your time. I'll just leave the poll sitting and then as soon as you've done it, um, can I just get a thumbs up for people uh, to say that you can see the poll? Great, perfect, that's fab. Um, so I'll leave that there and just uh, drop off the call when you're done, post any other final comments you've got for us in the chat and um, thanks ever so much for your time today. Thanks.